our, moving on to our next panel, our next conversation. And I want you all to think, how do storytellers think about and incorporate framing into their stories? Frames in environmental storytelling can be built around hope, despair, loss, innovation, and the future. Some say doomsday stories amplify urgency. Others say they're actually counterproductive because people will lose hope and a sense that they can't do anything about the situation. Some believe that innovation can gloss over the complexity or severity of the problem. How do these seasoned storytellers think about how they frame their stories? In our next discussion, I want you to listen about how the author controls how a story is framed and how you, as storytellers, can consider different framing before deciding which is the most compatible with what you're trying to communicate. Please welcome Jessica Stahl. Thank you so much. Wow, this is so exciting to be here. We have a fantastic panel on this discussion coming up in a second. I'm going to give some brief remarks first. Uh, I will try to be very brief because there are some fantastic people coming up. But I am so excited to be here to talk about this topic. Um, as the editor for creative storytelling at Grist, which for those who don't know, Grist is a nonprofit independent media organization covering climate justice and climate solutions. Um, so as the editor of what we call creative storytelling, this idea of framing is something that I think about basically all the time. This is my job. Uh, so when we talk about framing a story in journalism, typically what we mean is just like, how are we going to tell it? What aspects are we going to focus on? What do we want a reader to take away? How are we going to put all the pieces together, all of the reporting together to tell the story that we want to tell? At Grist, we're particularly focused on telling stories about climate change that are sort of often left out of mainstream coverage, that go beyond the big picture narrative of just like, this is really huge and scary, which it is really huge and scary, um, or the kind of overwhelming, just like we need to get away from fossil fuels, which like we really need to get away from fossil fuels. <laughs> um, both of those things are, are true. We need news coverage of those things as well. But at Grist, we're also always trying to ask, who does this impact and how are we telling their story? And that's not just getting comments from people in frontline communities, but really centering their stories and their voices, which I think of as kind of flipping the sort of so-called traditional approach on its head. It's not just kind of getting one source in there. Um, but really taking it on to understand how the climate crisis is affecting us, who it's affecting the most, and what really matters to the people who are being affected most. Uh, and in a way, this idea of, of kind of flipping the traditional narrative on its head, that drives our solutions focus as well. We talk a lot about how do we move beyond stories that just talk about the problems, that just talk about what people are against, and get into what people are for, what we could have instead, what's the world that we could build towards, and where does this already exist? And then examining those solutions with the same level of journalistic rigor that we bring to any other story that we tell. So it's not just swapping a negative frame for a positive one and kind of putting on our rose-colored glasses, but really taking a nuanced look at how solutions are unfolding. And I say all of that to, to just point out that an important part of framing starts with not just how you want to tell a story, but that idea of what stories you want to tell and why. Um, and I was really, really excited to hear that I'm now repeating what Caitlin said in the previous panel, um, because I think that is so important and it carries through kind of every piece of the journalism we do. And that question of why are we doing this and for whom that's what really, really interests me. Because I think often we let our thinking become too narrow when we talk about framing. We're talking about choices that we might make within a sort of predefined box. Like we're asking, what's the lead? What's the nut graph? But that's starting from a particular assumption about what the story is going to become. That there is a lead, there is a nut graph. It's a particular type of story. Um, but if we're asking, why are we telling this story? Who's it for? What do we want them to get out of it? How are they going to receive it? We can end up with really, really different answers and really different types of storytelling. 
So I'll just give this one example. Um, we just finished holding a series of listening sessions in Georgia as part of a project we're doing on Georgia's Public Service Commission, um, and all credit to the wonderful Lindsay Gilpin at Gris who, who ran these things. Um, but when you do that, when you go out and talk to people, what you really quickly discover is that most people are never going to seek out like a 5,000 word magazine feature on grist.org, right? They don't care about your like parallax scrolly telling, your map that like zooms as you scroll past it. If we want to create something of value for them, we need to think about like explainers that are easy to share in their Facebook groups or their neighborhood list serves printed materials that can live at community centers, maybe radio spots for local Spanish diaspora radio stations, a WhatsApp digest group for community leaders, right? It opens that much wider, and that's what's so exciting to me about this question of framing. We can ask the question not only how are we telling the story, but like Caitlin said, why and for whom? And that allows us to work towards telling the story that needs to be told in the way that it needs to be told and doing it both for and with the people that we're telling it for. And with that little bit of setup, let's get into this fantastic panel and bring in some other perspectives. So let's get Tyler and the rest of the panel up here. Oh my God. Oh, this is kind of a great mug. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, thanks for joining us on the, the panel today. I'm gonna introduce myself and then we'll kind of go down the line a little bit here. Um, but my name is Tyler Hickman. I am going to be moderating the panel today. I am a graduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder studying journalism. Um, I'm also a Planet Forward correspondent. Uh, just wrapped up my correspondency earlier this week. Uh, with my final story uh, that I published. And um, I'm also a 2023 StoryFest winner. I got to travel to Iceland with Planet Forward and Lindblad Expeditions for an am amazing experience, and I'm really excited to, uh, to see all of the finalists uh, this afternoon. Uh, well, you all just met me. I'm Jess Stahl. I'm the editor for Creative Storytelling at Grist. Uh, I'm Rachel Frazen. I cover energy and the environment for the Hill newspaper. Uh, I'm also working on a book about a class of toxic chemicals known as PFAS. And I'm Jesse J. Holland. I'm the Associate Director of the School of Media and Public Affairs and a longtime writer and author. <laughs> great, great. Um, I'm glad that we have such a, an eclectic group of, of journalists here. We really kind of cover a lot of bases with the, the mediums and the outlets. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested, I wanted to kind of start with the, how we determine uh, a frame for a story based on you know, your, your background. Take me through that process. At what point does the frame start to develop for you, whether it's during the reporting um, or after you've gathered all the information? And what are the factors that are most driving how you decide to, to tell a story? I want to start with you, Jess. Yeah, so I think as I just hinted uh, in what I was saying, for me, the idea of framing starts before you're ever telling the story. And it kind of starts with what are the values that you're bringing to the types of stories that you want to tell? Who's the audience that you're telling it for? What is that audience telling you about what they need? Um, and then that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the reporting process, which continues to refine your frame, which I think sometimes can refine all the way until the last moment before you're going to publish it. You can be tweaking. Uh, some of that lead, but but I think if you're not starting before you ever even hit the reporting, I think you're missing an opportunity to to get the right frame for the story you're trying to tell. Uh, I would say similar. I think if you're working on a breaking news story, you know you just try to get the most important information at the top, and then sort of do you know your classic inverted pyramid style. You know, get the who, what, when, where, why out there, and then get into the smaller, granular details. That you know, if somebody's only reading the first couple sentences, you want to get them the most important information. For a longer form piece, you know, I very much agree with what uh, Jess said, you know, keeping an open mind, but also having some idea of what the story is, you know, from the jump. One of the things that I emphasize for both authors and journalists is that one, you have to keep in mind that journalism is not stenography. 
we can't say everything. We're trying to get the information to people who need to read it. So our, when we're thinking about our stories, we also have to think about which ways will our audience consume this news? What is a way I can bring this information to someone in a way that they'll accept it? Because having all of this great news means absolutely nothing if nobody's listening. So your frame has to also take into consideration who you want to read the story and how you're going to get them into the information you want them to have. I think that's a, that's a really interesting point and it kind of leads into to what I wanted to talk about next. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation, Jess, about the, the story with Georgia. I know um, Grist is well known for making these big, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, scrolly telling stories, but um, <laughs> um, is that a real word, or do we scrolly, just use yeah. that yeah, internally? That's, that's what we call it. Yeah. I think it's a real okay, word. Um, we're going to make it a real word. <laughs> um, but it's not, there, there's, it's not always what people need to, to see. And I, I think that um, a lot of times the, the things that we're trying to communicate aren't reaching the right people. Um, I wanted to, to talk about how an audience can really influence a story frame and how you decide to tell a story when you're trying to reach an audience that isn't normally going to be, isn't subscribed to the, the Grist newsletter or isn't going to be logging onto the, the Hill to, to read the like, hard journalism style um, that, that you um, use. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think it is the question. Um, and the answer, unfortunately, it depends who that audience is, right? So we've done some projects at Grist, uh, and, and I used to run a department at Grist that was all about bringing climate news to people who are news consumers, but not climate news consumers. And that's a, very, that's a particular audience, right? So we were thinking about how do we tell climate stories kind of through the side door, start with a story that somebody might read and sort of gets them to climate. So one of the things that we did as part of that project was um, uh, what we called the Climate Future Cookbook. So this was a series that we did about food uh, and the future of food and, and the, imp the impact of the climate crisis on, on um, agriculture and food consumption. Um, but we told it through essentially recipes. We made a cookbook. Um, and that was obviously going after a very, very different type of audience, but the idea was like, can we take people who are interested in food and who might consume like Eater or um, I don't know the name of any food influencers, that's not my area, but you know, somebody who, <laughs> who reads those types of stories where it's like, here's my personal story and then here's a recipe that relates to my personal story. Can we, can we reach that kind of person with climate coverage? And that was a really fun project that I, that I think worked. We, um, we didn't take it all the way to the end, but I think the end of that project could have been like printing out that cookbook and bringing it to farmers markets. Um, and so something like that is really exciting. I think a very, very different type of audience is like local, local news consumers who are interested in what's happening in their community or should be interested in their community, right? And for those audiences, we're thinking a lot more about how do we work with local partners who are already reaching these people. So we have partnerships with a lot of different public radio stations, a lot of different local newspapers, um, and we're working with those partners to craft stories that fit with how their audience consumes information. But then the, the sort of third pillar of that is the community engagement, like I was talking about, where we're trying to reach people who are really not news consumers or who consume in a very specific way. And that really, really has to start with listening to those people and what they have to tell you about what they need and how they get information and then crafting our stories to their needs and their consumption patterns. And that is, you know, local neighborhood Facebook groups and listservs and trusted people within their neighborhood. That is much more information heavy than it is kind of like feature beautiful. You know, that is not the where you do this scrolly telling project. Um, but really listening and, and figuring out, you know, how do we fit into the consumption patterns that are already happening. I took too much time on that answer, so I will leave it there. <laughs> Talk about that forever. So the interesting thing about the Hill and covering you know, energy and climate for the Hill is that most of our audiences might not be there to see that climate story, right? They might be there to you know, hear about you know, 
the Trump legal saga or you know the latest election polls. And so I think a part of it is just grabbing people in from the jump. Writing a good headline is huge. And luckily, um, it's not just me on that. We've got a lot of good editors who <laughs> make me sound more interesting than I am. No, uh, this is all very interesting. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that's a big piece of it. You know, a lot of it is also social media, both you know, for the platform for the Hill. We've got you know, social media that is not my area, but you know, we've got a lot of good social media people. And then you know, also you know, as a journalist, using my own personal social media, as you know, people who follow me on uh, Twitter might be more interested in you know that climate and energy news and more likely to click on it so I think using your own you know social media accounts and also having your colleagues cross promote is a, is a big one too you know so I like to celebrate my colleagues when they do good journalism they like to celebrate me when I do good journalism so and one of the things that we need to think about when we're uh, getting ready to craft the story and deciding a frame is going beyond what we're comfortable with I mean I'm, I'm a longtime wordsmith what I what I do is work in words but when I want someone to read a major project, I have to think beyond just words. I have to play around with social media. I have to figure out video. I have to figure out audio. I'm teaching myself drones now <laughs> because I know a fabulous drone footage at the top of a story will make someone who would not have stopped to read the 2,000, 3,000 words I wrote, that'll make, maybe make them interested and getting into the story to see what this video was actually about. So when we're crafting our stories, we also have to think about not only who our audience is, we also have to look at ourselves and find out what we're comfortable with and go beyond that. If I want Gen Zers to read something that I write, I know I can't just throw words at them. I'm going to have to look, have to look at how does this translate to Snapchat and Instagram? How does this translate to social media? What kind of video do I, can I get with this? It's something we, especially us older journalists, have to get around in our heads in that words aren't enough anymore. The reporting itself isn't enough. How we tell the story, how people receive the story is what we should be more interested in, the final project, not just what we're comfortable doing. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, trying to to reach people with a frame on, on social media is so much different than, uh, than writing a book, which I know that you have written several of them. And uh, we, we spoke about um, developing that frame and, and having that, that mindset going into the reporting. But I can imagine that when you're taking on a project like writing a book, that that frame can change sometimes um, and can shift as you start to talk to people. So I'm interested, uh, I would love it if you could share an instance um, where, and we can start with you, Jesse, uh, that frame that you went into kind of shifted as you started to talk to people, as you started to like dig into history or, or documents, if you could give an example. Well, one of the worst things that can happen to you in your life is that you make a plan and you realize your plan's re absolutely ridiculous once you're halfway down the road. But <laughs> Honestly, that is what happens. Uh, the advice I give authors is, for some, for some writers, writing any project, they sit down and words just flow out of their heads. I have to make a plan for this to work. So my advice is, if you're thinking about some, uh, writing a, any type of large project, it's like putting two addresses in Google Maps. You, your, your starting point and your end point. But you have no idea what roads are going to be blocked. You have no idea where it's going to divert you to because you haven't taken the journey yet. We have to make sure that we're not so rigid with our ideas that this is the frame I have to use. This is the way I have to tell the story. Because you have no idea what you're going to find. You have no idea what information is going to be correct. You have no idea of what information is going to be available to you. You may find something that's better. The absolute worst thing that's ever happened to me in my writing life is I had to throw away 20,000 words in a book. Because I started out with the idea of this is what the story was, found out that wasn't what the story was. And so those were, for the project to be complete and accurate, those words had to go. I mourned them. <laughs> I still mourn them to this day and try to find a, and one day I'm going to find a way to use those 20,000 words. But we can't be so locked in on this is the way this story has to be told 
that we sacrifice the integrity of the project. What, we, what our goal is, is a project at the end that you can be proud of and that your audience can read and learn from. So when my co-author and I were piecing together our book, we originally weren't doing it as so much of a narrative. When we had first sort of conceived the book, we kind of wanted it to be just sort of an overview. And we would have you know, different chapters delving into different topics and use storytelling within those chapters, but you know, not necessarily have a broad overarching story. But then we were worried that that wouldn't be accessible to a lot of people. And we are trying to you know, make this story compelling. I mean, it is compelling. And we want to tell it in a way that people are invested in sort of the overarching narrative. So we very much shifted sort of the structure or our plan for our structure for our book from you know, when we originally decided we wanted to work on a book to you know, the time we started you know, pitching it out to people, to publishers. And so, but there was one chapter that we had originally sort of written as a sample chapter that sort of no longer fit into what we were trying to do. And so we did, we had to cut it and, you know, maybe repurpose some of that reporting into other projects and for other pieces. And we're fortunate that we, in addition, sort of have our platform at the Hill and editors who are very willing and excited that we're so excited about this topic and willing to publish some of our more niche stuff. But yeah, sometimes you have to make those tough calls. And, you know, as they say, sometimes you have to kill your darlings and that's okay. I've never written a book and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very, very hard, <laughs> especially listening to them. But I, I will just say, you know what Jesse was saying about um, sometimes you come across pieces of information that make you have to really change your idea of what the story is. I think that happens with any length of reporting, and you know, hopefully we have time for it in all of our stories. I, I know we don't always, but you know, we do get in a habit as reporters of just saying like, oh, I, I just need one person to give me a quote that says like blah, and you go find the person to give you that quote. But actually, if you can listen to that person and sort of spend a little bit more time with them, sometimes it does change your idea of what the story is. I think particularly when you're talking to people from frontline communities or lower income communities who are most impacted by the climate crisis, if you go in with the intention to not just say like, oh, I just need somebody to tell me how bad this is, but to have the opportunity to really listen to what they're experiencing, it can change the story. And it's, it's great when we can make the time to do that even on our deadlines. And, and let me jump in right qu really quickly about something she just said, uh, that Jess just said. One of the reasons why we talk so much about thinking about the frames and intentions in advance is because you run into time and deadline issues. And it's much harder to think about these things when something is due in 24 hours or six hours or eight hours or a month or a week. This is why we push so hard about thinking about your intention for writing the story, thinking about how you're going to tell it, what methods you need to tell it in advance, because you don't want to be thinking about these things on deadline. Because this is where corners get cut and mistakes can be made when you're trying to repurpose something at the last second, when something is due. I, I can't. I've had to throw away paragraphs, and that rips my heart out. <laughs> I can't imagine throwing away 20,000 words or an entire chapter. We throw away like full stories. Like, I definitely oh, have to throw no, away like, entire stories. Yeah. stories <laughs> it's incredible. Um, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I youth. have pain. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, especially with uh, the editor of Grist here, uh, about solutions, climate solutions journalism, and um, you know, how themes in environmental journalism can also often paint a really grim picture of the future. But, and you spoke to this a little bit, Jess, about um, having the, the solutions, having that voice in the community, looking at the, the positives. But there is the need for, for balance, I, I, I think. Um, and that's something that I think we emphasize at Planet Forward as well. Can you talk about how you strike that balance in your reporting between the urgency and between uh, highlighting positive initiatives um, and how that can influence the way that you decide to frame a story? Yeah, for sure. And if people here are not familiar with the Solutions Journalism Network, that's a really great resource for um, understanding how to write about solutions and how to do it with the type of nuance you're talking about. Because I think, you know, while it is problematic to only be talking about the problems, I think it is equally problematic to only 
be like, these solutions are here, they're great, look, everything's wonderful. Because that is not the case either, right? There's so much technology, you know, startups that you can write about, but like, are any of those things gonna make a difference? We don't know yet. So for me, the approach to solutions is as rigorous as the approach to covering problems. And I, and I think that's what helps you straight, strike the balance. We want to be talking about solutions. We want to be able to focus on what is already out there, what is already starting to make a difference, who's got ideas that are starting to figure it out. But you don't want to just present those things as like, here's the good news. And I think a lot of places that I see cover climate, they have solutions as like their good news, kind of like palette cleanser, and it's sort of separate from the other coverage. Um, and I think that that is really problematic. This is all part of the same story. We have to cover the solutions as real stories and be able to point out, here's what's working, here's what's not working, here's what the potential is, here's the potential issues with that. And, and you know, sometimes that's really easy to do. And then some climate solutions are like really nuanced and really controversial. Like if you're covering carbon capture, it's a really complicated story. And to just cover it as either bad or good, you're missing kind of like everything important in the middle. And so my whole thing on solutions is like, you have to be including solutions, you have to be talking about what's happening, but you have to be talking about it with the same journalistic rigor that you are taking to covering the problems and telling that full spectrum of the story of where we're at now in the climate crisis. Yeah, so I think that it's really important to be honest with people about the gravity of the problem. And I think that you know we shouldn't let a fear of sort of climate doomerism prevent us from being straight with people and telling them you know, what a big deal this is, especially for a news outlet like The Hill, where our audience is a very broad range of people who have varied you know, opinions on even the existence of climate change, right or wrong, it, it is what it is. So I think that in that role, it is important to be honest with people. But like just said, I also think it's important to talk about solutions critically and not just, you know, this is the solution. You need to tell people about the good, the bad, the ugly, the trade-offs, because, you know, some solutions might combat climate change, but they might worsen pollution or they might, you know, put people out of work. And those are consequences are also important to talk about. We definitely need to have in, in our journalism a full picture, and that includes the problem and any possible solutions. One of the things that we should ensure that we do when we get ready to frame and talk about our stories is, I personally prefer outlines. Everybody doesn't, everybody doesn't outline it in, like I do anymore. But when we put together our outlines for these projects, we should think about not only telling our audiences how severe the problem is, but what type of solutions are available. And we do it in a way where we're, I hate these words nowadays, but fair and balanced. <laughs> Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the insight, guys. I think we're, our, our shot clock is running a little bit over today, but some really fantastic uh, perspectives on, on how we frame stories from some incredible journalists. So thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so really appreciate it. The, the framing thing is really huge, and we can come back on that. So we're going to play a little, uh, we're going to take a break here, sort of, in the, in the flow of things, and do a little, um, anybody ever go to trivia night or play trivia, right? Um, we, we might want to do that. We have these books here. We got books. We yeah. Got gifts. So got gifts. This, this book is called The Future of Exploration. It was put together by a very good friend of ours, Terry Garcia, who used to be at National Geographic Channel and National Geographic and is on our advisory uh, uh, council. And this book it takes you through um, chapters written by explorers, incredible people, from Sylvia Earle to Jane Goodall to um, just in amazing folks who go to all different places. And so, I, got, I saw this too. Yeah, how Anyone did that get there? Anyone seen this one? That was, that was going to be this the consolation prize. Consolation prize. Yeah. This other guy wrote I, I this. I did that. We thought we'd throw in one extra. Book. Just so, one extra. Okay. So, sh should we do this? Let's do it. All right. So, here's how this is going to work. If you think you, if you know, so you don't have a buzzer like you can't go, eh, but no. you can raise your hand, right? Okay. So, if you think you know the answer to the question, raise your hand, and Kim, you can help us figure out. Who the first, where the first questions are. Or no first, pressure. Uh, first um, hands that go up. All right? You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Um, who was the first 
person to climb Mount Everest. Somebody knows this. I know you. There's a hand over right here. There. There's the a hand there. Which was first? In the back. I saw in the back of glasses. Okay. I saw it. Yes, you. You can stand, please. Wait. Here's the mic. We got a mic. It's all right. Just shout it out. Go ahead. Who do you know? Edmund Hillary. Yes, it was on May. Yes, round of applause there. Okay, thank you. We got a book. All May right, so 29th, 1953. Right. Just putting right, that out right. there. Um, okay. Got a book. Let's see. Here's the next one. I need. I need hand watchers. I'm watching. Ready? All right. Question number two. Which park was America's first national park? Boom! Right there. Absolutely. In 1872, a new law was enacted to protect Yellowstone, which became the country's first national park. The government had more of a challenge with Yellowstone, however, because the land to be protected was part of Wyoming territory, not a state yet. So there was no local government. So they did it anyway. So Yellowstone is the answer. So American. All right. Congratulations. All right. All right. You get the next one. How big is the Amazon rainforest? Oh, we may have stumped him. Possibly, it was like it's a guess. A guess, and the number of square mi- uh, square miles. We got a guess. Oh, it's in square miles. Just a guess. Four hundred and thirty-three thousand two hundred and sixty. That's a good guess. <laughs> good number. That's a good guess. Anybody else? But That's no. A good guess. Close. Anybody kind else? Of, kind of. <laughs> nope. Somebody's getting the millions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you're a little carried away there. It's but like you're... Price is Right. Price is Right. Down. Yes. Yes. Green shirt. Sorry. Five million. No. You're over. Two billion. Oh. Two billion? Two million. Did you say two million? Yeah. Did he say two million? He did. I heard that. That's close enough. That's close enough. 2.72 2 million. Yeah. million square miles. <laughs> the Amazon rainforest is the size of Mexico, Mongolia, Peru, and Egypt combined. It's pretty big. That's how big the rainforest That's is. That's pretty big. There's a lot to protect the lungs of the earth. Yes. Okay? All right. Is yeah. the next one mine or yours? That's I forget. Out you go. Okay. Who? All right. Who's watching for hands? You ready? Watching. Who made the Galapagos famous and what book did this person's exploration inspire? Green shirt. Green shirt right here. Okay. And, and what book? We got a hand in the back. Bah. Hand here. <laughs> no, I saw a question. Yeah. Hand in the back. Origin of species. Origin of species. You got Charles it. Darwin, Origin of species. Well done. Charles Darwin and the Origin of Species will always be linked with the Galapagos, although he was only in the Galapagos for five weeks. In anybody know the year? 1874. 1874. Nope. 1850. Nope. 1835, it was the wildlife he saw there that inspire, inspired him to develop his theory of? Evidence. Good, all right. <laughs> and as someone who's been to the Galapagos, I agree with everything that he saw. We're going to the Galapagos this summer. Oh, yeah. uh, the winners from StoryFest today, some will go to the Galapagos, some will go to Iceland. All right, next. Who is the most well-known woman ethologist known for research on chimpanzees? Ooh, that's hard. I don't know. Where was the first hand? Kim? We got one. We got I think folks who are like claiming she did it. I'll give it to them. Okay. Right what? there. Right there. Yes. Jane Goodall. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Bravo. Jane Goodall is able to correct a number of misunderstandings about chimpanzees. She's found, for example, that the animals are omnivorous, not vegetarian. They're capable of making and using tools, and they have a set. They had a set of hitherto unrecognized, complex, and highly developed social behaviors. That's true. Now we just gave away that those books, and that's a wonderful thing. But I thought, <laughs> you know, wait, I, I, I wrote this book. All right, wrote a book. And we're going to do we're going to do one of those. All right, he wrote a book, and, and I'm dead because it's that's all true. about questions. That, it's yeah, about yeah. the questions we ask, and we're doing that now. And what the heck? And so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, does anyone know, and my, this is literally one of my son and I's favorite shows, but does anyone know how old David Attenborough is? Any, any idea? Hand over here. Is? 92? Nope. Ooh, I see the gentleman here in the lovely shirt. 97. 97, 97. That's very correct. good. And he turns 98 on May 8th. Coming up 
and the, his voice is so soothing. David Attenborough <laughs> has created more than 100 documentaries in his life, written a book, and he's inspired love of nature in lots because of the storytelling he does. Mm -hmm.